Hello and welcome to The Wire. A very happy new year. My name is Indra Shekhar Singh. And today we are going to be talking about the agrarian economy, the problems of the Indian economy and future predictions for 2024. Joining me on the show is prominent economist, Professor Jayati Ghosh, who will be talking about all these issues and telling us her take on these. So without wasting much time, I'd like to invite Professor Jayati Ghosh on the show. Yeah. So for the first question, uh, welcome to the show. And our first question to you is, how do you see the state of the Indian agrarian economy? And especially in light of the fact that the GDP numbers reported a, a basically a, a slowing down of the agrarian economy in India. How do you see agriculture? You know, Indian agriculture has not been very healthy now for some time. And I think that's a real concern because farmers have been raising these issues and it's been evident in some of the data that do come out. We we are increasingly short of really the data that would allow us to grasp how the Indian economy is doing. But whatever data is coming out, whether it's on employment or it's on other indicators, suggests that really Indian agriculture is not in good shape. There are pockets that are doing well, especially in horticulture in certain areas. But large parts of the agrarian economy are in a serious problem. I won't say crisis, but they're facing very severe problems, especially because costs are rising faster than prices and yields are not improving at a similar rate. Now, when we look at India, and especially that given that next year is an election year, and it's about 600 million Indians depend on agriculture for their incomes, for their livelihoods, and even for food. Here, one side we have, you're saying that if people are not getting the right prices for their for their for their for their food crops and on the other side we have 80 crore indians who need to depend on government rations for food how is it possible that in a hungry nation food is not valued what is happening here what it's, yeah this is of course a very serious problem and it really comes from the fact that we have mismanaged the food economy, I would say, for quite some time. And we have, when we take measures, unfortunately, they have been half measures and they haven't been sufficient. You are talking about 80 crore Indians needing food rations. Actually, it should be much more. We should be providing it to at least 100 crore because the people who are getting these food rations, it's based on a, a list made in 2011. We haven't actually done a proper survey of poverty or of living conditions since then. We are not doing the NSS consumption survey, which should have been done, which was done in 2017-18. The government didn't like the results, so they suppressed the data, and they haven't done one since then. So we have no basis on which to look at consumption, at poverty, at how people are actually managing and the conditions under which they're living. What we do know is that since 2011, the numbers of those who are food insecure would have gone up greatly. And in fact, the FAO has estimated that approximately 72% of Indians cannot afford what they consider to be the minimum healthy, affordable diet. I think that's a very stark revelation that you just pointed out, that FAO data, which, which came out and said about 75% of India is not even getting the food that we deserve to eat for a normal, dignified human living. They cannot afford to buy they what afford the it. FAO calls the minimally nutritious diet. Or the dignified meal, like with, with, with 2,000 or 2,500 calories a day. Now, this is the state of the Indian economy. Now, when we look at, again, the policies, the economic policies of the Modi government, and I'll, I'd like to bring your attention to the doubling farmers income program, which was a direct verbatim of, you know, an American economic uh, committee of economic development document, which says, you know, move farmers out of farming, bring the cultivators into industrial jobs, uh, reduce the class of people that are there, bring education, bring other, you know, high effective technologies. So we followed the Western model for the past 10 years. We followed an American model for the last 10 years. Now, even with this sound economic thinking, and I'm saying sound with inverted commas, we've landed to a point of hunger. We've landed to a point of, you know, the biggest farmers movement. In fact, the biggest movement in the world emerging in Delhi and also a major like I know you will not call it a crisis, but there is a crisis in agriculture. After Even after the Modi government tried to implement the doubling farmers income program, tried to import ideas from the West and print it in India, what's wrong with the economic thinking of the government, especially when it comes to agriculture? You know, I think part of the problem is that these goals are set without any clear roadmap about how to get there. 
And then, of course, you have to keep changing the goalpost. I mean, farmer, doubling farmers' income was a campaign pledge in 2014. It got shifted from 2019 to 2022 to 20. I, I don't know what the latest goalpost is. You keep shifting it back because, in fact, there is no strategy to get there. There is no roadmap about how exactly you're going to double farmers' income. Yet we know what has to be done. The Farmers Commission, headed by Ms. Swaminathan, gave many very detailed recommendations, a lot of which are extremely sensible. And in fact, what the government should have done is just gone about and tried to implement these. It hasn't done that because of lack of political will. So it's not that we don't know what has to be done. There are many things which have successive commissions have pointed out. I was on a farmers commission in Andhra Pradesh in 2004, and we gave again very detailed recommendations. The farmers commission has provided very large, extensive, but also detailed guidelines on things that can be done. But unfortunately, this government basically just likes to create goals and make a big sort of sound about it without doing any of the things. The farmers movement itself has talked about so many things that could be done. And mm -hmm. they have given very specific proposals. Unfortunately, those are not being met. Even the state government that try and implement some of these, they face huge pushback from the central government. They face reduction in the money that they get in terms of federal transfers. They face opposition in terms of changing laws. And there's actually really attempts to browbeat and push state governments into doing a much more neoliberal strategy, which really doesn't work. Now, and you know, you very, very interestingly, you brought about the Swami Nathan Commission. You now, many of your fellow researchers and fellow economists would actually rally against it and saying that the MSP is going to be the problem of Indian agriculture and, and food inflation. And how are you going to keep all these things in check? Are you actually saying to me that, uh, you know, the 50, the formula of 50% profits over the cost of production actually is economically sound and it may work for India? Is that what I'm hearing? You know, you mentioned a little bit earlier that the U.S. model we are following, if we yes. were, well, the U.S. has support prices. The U.S. offers protection to farmers. The U.S. gives mm -hmm. very large farm subsidies, subsidies that we can only dream about in India. So, in fact, the U.S. model or the Japanese model or the European model all involve heavy subsidies to agriculture. Mm -hmm. In our case, in, in the Indian case, I think we have to remember some critical things. One, food sovereignty is essential. Mm -hmm. We seem to have forgotten that, but food, they remember it every now and then. They will suddenly stop the exports of potatoes or onions or tomatoes whenever it suits the government. But food sovereignty is critical. And it is critical because food can be a weapon, as we have seen in many mm -hmm. different cases. So to ensure food sovereignty, you have to make food cultivation viable, profitable, something that farmers choose to do. And until you can ensure that there are technological improvements, productivity increases, uh, to ensure sustainable agriculture, and I emphasize sustainable, either mm -hmm. organic or using less chemicals or what have you, Unless you can ensure that that can happen in a way in which it is commercially profitable, you're not going to get food sovereignty. So it is critical for us as a nation to ensure that farmers who are producing this most essential of all items, food, in all its variety, and in the most sustainable, ecologically desirable kinds of ways, we have to make sure that they get a minimum return. We have pay commissions for government servants. We have, you know, crazy salaries for private sector in finance and so on. Somehow all of that is seen as all right. Even when you could argue that a lot of the finance is not really that important for the economy. It's really mm -hmm. just circulating surpluses among the rich. Why are we not ensuring that those who are producing this most essential thing, which is necessary for us even strategically as a country, that they are not being given their due? This is I something think, many other countries have done. So we wouldn't be unusual in doing this. I see for the viewers, let me just explain when I when I and this is a clarification also for Professor Ghosh that in the 19 India's following policies of the 1950s and 1970s, which the US uh, agriculture adopted back then. So when I when I said that, I didn't say that they are following contemporary policies, but rather following policies between the 1950s and 1970s in America, which is again expanding the farmer base, giving out free credit loans, and then overproduction. The, the problems are very similar. I'm not saying the same, but the problems are very similar. And that's what I was referring to. Now, moving to the Indian uh, kind of economy at large, because Having discussed agriculture, agriculture plays a very important role, not just 
in the formal economy but also in the informal economy when which all of us are involved in right we eat food that's part of also agriculture so where do you see india headed for and i'll begin with uh, you know this revelation by the imf which says that by 2028 or 2027 indian gdp will be 100% equal to its debt like uh, how what what does that even mean for for regular folk well you know that refers to the debt taken on by the government mm-hmm. and um, yes the debt to gdp ratio is rising at the moment it's really quite low by global standards most of the rich countries the advanced economies have debt gdp ratios above 100% in japan it is closer to 300% in many middle income countries it is also close to 100% so it's not like there is a huge catastrophe that will happen if your debt to gdp ratio is a certain level especially if that debt is in indian rupees so i don't think there's a problem unless it is external debt if it is external debt there is a problem and there's no question about it that we should avoid having too much external debt as much as possible because countries who have large external debt are facing all kinds of constraints difficulties and real issues in debt servicing for precious foreign exchange which dramatically set back the development project so i don't think debt is india's problem in fact my problem is that the indian government doesn't spend enough in the critical areas where it needs to we are in a weird kind of crony capitalism where we really provide resources we fight subsidies we provide cheap bank credit and we allow defaults for large crony capitalists we do not provide credit to micro small and medium enterprises who need it the most and who are the backbone of the indian economy including in agriculture we do not provide the kind of entire package for survival that is absolutely necessary and as a result our gdp growth is extraordinarily unequal you know people have talked about the k shaped recovery in india it's beyond the k now i mean the income of the top 10% it's off the charts i would argue that probably 80 90% of this increase in gdp that we have been experiencing goes to the top 10%, 10% of the economy the hope that it will trickle down is a very uh, tenuous hope it hasn't been shown in any other country it doesn't really work and what that has meant is that at le- i mean about 80% of the population and certainly the bottom half face more fragile more insecure and much worse conditions so many indicators point to this the fact that you know the employment data there's a lot of noise about how there's more women working and employment levels have gone up it's only because of unpaid women working in agriculture unpaid that's not good news that's terrible news mm-hmm. women working in unpaid fashion on family farms or small enterprises how is that good news that is bad news similarly the uh, nutrition data it's terrible childhood stunting childhood undernutrition we are among the worst countries in the world worse than many countries in sub saharan africa in terms of these aggregate data of nutrition health conditions maternal mortality all of these suggest that you know we are really way behind in our development project we are not focusing on the majority of the people we are not enabling them to actually reach what we would call a dignified life and yes there is massive income explosion in the top 10% you can see it in our cities you can see it in the explosion of conspicuous consumption some of that trickles down to the next 20% and maybe a little bit more to the next 30% but the bulk of the population is facing greater material poverty greater insecurity greater fragility that cannot be good news economically it's terrible news socially and at some point it will also become bad news politically now um, you know you've raised very very important points there and i think i want to drill on three points that you raised and first is about women like if you look at the human cost of a bad economy or a nutritional crisis it's actually women who are suffering the most they are not only suffering from the economic problems but the social problems mm-hmm. that come when the economy goes down from domestic violence to abuse to to a whole plethora of like just bad 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 things so also just could you sharpen your comment on women and then i'll move to the next point like women are actually when there is a bad economic policy when there is a bad economic decision it's actually in the real time women of a country or women of a society that 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 get kicked the most now 
could you talk about a little bit of that yes it's not but you know i would argue it's not just in the bad times i would argue that indian economic growth the whole accumulation story has been based on the unpaid and underpaid labor of women so you know the whole idea that if you are uh, not employed that is if you're not uh, earning a wage you're not working that's simply false we mm-hmm. know that uh, at least almost 90% of indian women of working age are involved in unpaid labor that is to say they are looking after they are doing the care economy they're looking after the old the young the sick and those who are healthy but still have to be cooked for and whose houses have to be cleaned and so on they're doing all of that unpaid work they're doing poultry raising kitchen gardening ch- tutoring children fetching water fetching fuel wood in rural areas you know huge amounts of unpaid work are done by women in india and that's part of the reason why we have such a low employment rate why so few women can actually work for any wages or any remuneration it also means we have one of the largest gender gaps in the world women on average earn less than 2/3 of what men on average earn even mm-hmm. when they're doing very similar kinds of work they are involved in some of the most back breaking work without any social protection and it's not mm-hmm. just the private employers who are doing this the public sector is just as complicit because the government employs women as anganwadi workers and helpers as ashas as scheme workers in general and they don't get the minimum wage they are all employed as volunteers which means mm-hmm. you don't have to pay them regular salaries you don't have it's like a gift you're giving them rather than a regular wage we are the only country in the world that runs public services on the backs of unpaid underpaid women workers who are not even recognized as regular workers so to See, me it's not just the bad times it is that the good times have also been based on exploiting the underpaid labor of women just because that's a very very terrible thing to begin the turn 24 with but something that we all need to think very deeply about now the second question in this from the points that you raise is what is the human cost of this trickle down economics what is the human cost that the indian people are suffering of this top approach where you know some people are given the money some people are you know their loans are waived and sorry waived off some some people get every all the benefits that the government is intending for the country and what is the human cost of that are 80000 80 crore uh, people or 75% of the population the human cost that the country has to suffer for the advancement of a few you know the human cost is is multidimensional right it's mm-hmm. in all kinds of different ways but i would highlight two areas where it is extremely evident one is in our extremely poor human development indicators as you know mm-hmm. india is what 121 or 122 rank in human development and even that rank is only because gdp is one third of that index if mm-hmm. you leave out the gdp we are below we are in the bottom 10 i think of countries in terms of human development which is unbelievable given the ambitions of our leaders who want to be among the top countries in the world who want to be geopolitically significant and play on the world stage if you cannot give your people the minimum in terms of human development what does that say about you as a as an economy and a society so there is a terrible human cost in terms of poor living conditions health education housing uh, mobility access to the basic kinds of things in life food nutrition all of these and as i said it's not just 80 million people or a, 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 sorry 80, 80 crore people it's um, it's more like 100 crore people Who mm-hmm. will need food assistance, and the fact that they're not getting it is our fault. It's because we haven't even counted them since 2011. But that's to me one of the major human costs. But the second one is employment, and to me the employment challenge is actually, in a way, more terrible because you know we have. we thought we were going to have a demographic dividend we have a disproportionate number of young people there's a bulge right and mm-hmm. many of these people are coming into working age we've also expanded education tertiary education so many many more people are getting higher degrees unfortunately most of that is privatized about 70 to 80% of tertiary education is private now so people are spending money they are selling assets and land they're going into debt to get this tertiary education at the end of that there are no jobs 
we are not generating good quality jobs. Even the regular employment we're generating, a lot of it is very poor quality. It's mm -hmm. not what we, you and I, would consider a proper job. And that is terrifying because it's not just a huge waste of our human capacities and capabilities, of which of course it is, mm -hmm. but it is also a recipe for social and political conflict, for, uh, you know, for different kinds of unhappiness. The reason why we're getting so many poisonous divisions in society is because especially young people feel frustrated, feel hopeless, feel angry. And it's much easier to take your anger out on someone near you someone you can identify as an other, rather than at a system which seems too far away, too distant to actually be able to do anything about it. So the fact that we are not generating good quality employment, which is because we are relying on this very top heavy growth, only to the top 10%, we're not considering raising the micro, small and medium enterprises, ensuring that they're viable, making them contribute to the economy in a sustained way so that they can actually employ more people. We're not doing that. And if we don't do that, we're going to get more frustration, more violence of the worst kind. I'm not saying that this will lead to anything good. It, it leads to only bad things. And that in turn weakens our economy as well. It's, it's a vicious cycle in terms of how lack of employment generation generates social and political tensions, which in turn worsen the conditions for economic activity. So, you know, to me, that, that major failure of employment is possibly even worse than the failure to meet human development because the two are so closely linked. Uh, Professor Gosi, from what you're telling me, it sounds like, you know, the post between interwar Germany like the economic conditions and the kind of violence and hate and other, other the sociological effects of a bad economy. Um, but I'm not going to get deeper into the post-war Germany bit, sorry, in the interwar Germany years. My last question to you would be, how do you see, uh, uh, what is your kind of, uh, if, if, you know, economists are not uh, future tellers, but if you could, but if you could look at what everything that's happened in the past 10 years, and this is an election year 2024, how do you see the economy, the you know, the economic prosperity of this country. Where is it going? Where is the economic prosperity of citizens going? Are we expecting a good twenty twenty four from the signs that you're seeing factually? You know, I would think that there would be a good twenty twenty four for the economy if there was a change of course. I really believe there has. You to You mean be a political course, course or economic course? Like, sorry, just. In terms of, I'm talking about economic strategy. Okay, sure. Where, whether that change would require a change in political course is not for me to talk about. Of course. Yeah, yeah. But clearly there has to be a change in the economic strategy. We cannot keep going along with this crony capitalist model that relies on exploiting the poor, the lower castes, women, minorities through segmented labor markets that relies on exploiting tribal communities through the extraction of mineral resources that relies on a, a increase in demand from really only a small proportion of the population, top 10%, maybe 15%, rather than a more broad-based and equitable expansion. I do believe that Yes, maybe it'll continue to grow at this crazy rate because, you know, even 10% is, is a lot of people. It's almost 100, it's more than 140 million people, right? So yes, it would be a lot. It would still be a large market. It would not give us either the human development or the employment generation or the stable and um, benign society that we would like. It would not give us economic or social inclusion and it would create tensions that will be harder and harder to control. Well, I thank you for, for your comments. And I know this is not a very pretty picture, but I'm sure India can work towards creating a better future for us. You know, citizens. we have so much going for us. We can yes. do so much. So it is possible. If only we change course, there is so much good that could happen. No, I am a firm believer of hope. And, and, I, and I believe that viewers watching this, you don't have to believe me or her. You have to make up your own facts. That's what at The Wire we always encourage. We would really encourage you to read about the law, the fall of the USSR, about Brazil and about the American economy between the 1950s and 1970s. And then come to your own conclusions because always we don't have to reinvent the wheel. So thank you for watching and being with us on The Wire. Thank you, Professor Ghosh. And if there are any comments that you'd like to tell Professor Ghosh or you have for me or for the show, 
please don't forget to comment on our YouTube channel and tweet on our Twitter page. So thank you so much for watching and being with us. The Wire will have more programs for you very soon. Thank you.